Hello and welcome to the TriDoc Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sankoff, the TriDoc, an emergency physician and multiple Ironman finisher, coming to you from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. This past weekend, I got to do something that I have never done before, and in so doing, broadened my horizons just a wee bit by participating in the inaugural SBT gravel race in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Along with several of my teammates from the Dark Horse Triathlon Squad, we joined over a thousand other riders for routes that covered anywhere from 37 to 141 miles over gravel roads around the ski resort town. Now, I don't want to talk too much about the race itself right now, as it will be the subject of an upcoming episode of the Triathlete Ruta, but I do want to comment on a couple of really important things that I learned while spending nine hours in the saddle on that beautiful day. The first thing is that as a triathlete, I too often let myself feel as though I have to spend my time on the bike, an arrow, lest I not be getting the specificity to my training that I feel like I have to have. I'm sure that many of you must feel the same, but the reality is that nothing could be further from the truth. Never mind the fitness benefits of a 140 plus mile on a gravel bike climbing some 10,000 feet, but the psychological benefits of the experience cannot be overstated either. I frequently mix in road riding to my training, as it's a great way to build strength through long days of climbing and technical skills on the equally long descents. But I now also have a much greater appreciation for how soothing a long gravel ride can be, and how fantastic an experience a ride like this is in a group. So don't be shy to mix in something that you have little to no experience in once in a while. You'll definitely be better for it, and I assure you, your fitness will surely improve as well. The second thing that I learned on this ride was how incredibly relaxing it is to ride a bike when you don't have to worry about cars. On a recent episode of the podcast, I talked with Megan Hotman, the cyclist lawyer, about the ongoing conflict between cyclists and drivers on our roads. I am so sad to have to say that since that time a short few weeks ago, three cyclists have been killed by motorists in and around Denver. One of them, Alexis Bounds, a 37-year-old mom of two, was hit and killed just blocks from where I live on a street that I ride on all of the time. Seeing her ghost bike reminded me once again how precarious we all are when we do the simple action of setting off on our bikes to go for a training ride. Compounding the misery of a family destroyed by a reckless driver was the completely tone-deaf response of other drivers to news of the tragedy. In online commentaries and on social media, motorists piled on with their usual refrains of cyclists are to blame and cyclists shouldn't be on the road and cyclists get what they deserve if they ride on roads where cars are. I shake my head in disbelief and really anger when I see people espousing vehicular homicide as a solution to their potentially being inconvenienced for 10 seconds while on their way to the local Chick-fil-A to pick up a bucket of grease for dinner. Until we can all agree that someone dying unnecessarily is a horrible tragedy, and that if it can be avoided, it should be, then we really don't have a starting point for rational discourse at all. What I find hard to understand is how motorists can't conceive of the notion that cyclists actually drive cars as well, and so we are keenly aware of both sides of the arguments. For example, as a motorist, I cringe when I see cyclists flaunt the rules of the road. Running stop signs and traffic lights, riding unpredictably in traffic, these are all ways to give the rest of us a bad name. There are also actions that make it far more likely that I'm going to see more ghost bikes on my commute. So perhaps we as cyclists can take the high road on this one. We could certainly diffuse one of the recurrent arguments that motorists make in blaming cyclists for getting killed by vehicles. That is, we could all agree to follow the rules of the road and behave the way we would want other cyclists to when we're driving. That, and we could ride more gravel, where there are almost no vehicles to be seen and when you can just completely relax and enjoy the ride without worrying that you won't make it back home. On the show today... Cam Dye was a professional triathlete for 12 years, during which he had 36 victories and a bronze medal at the ITU World Championship Relays. Cam retired last year to become a wealth manager with a firm in Boulder, and he joins me on the podcast to discuss his career, his transition to life after triathlon, and his thoughts on the future of the sport. The triathlete Routard stays very local to review the iconic Boulder 70.3 race, one of the oldest races on the WT circuit. The half Ironman in Boulder is one that I am intimately familiar with and have had varying degrees of success at racing in. On this episode, I bring you the lowdown on this scenic and popular race. First, though, I have a listener question to answer. As much as I hope this question will apply to as few of you as possible, the hard truth is that cyclists and collarbone fractures have a tendency to go together. For decades, the only way to manage these breaks was conservatively, by placing the affected arm in the sling and allowing time for healing. 
In the past 15 years, though, surgical repair of the collarbone has become increasingly popular as an option for managing these fractures. If you have the misfortune of falling and sustaining this injury, what should you do to take care of it? I review the evidence and give you my best assessment, coming up. As I've become a much more avid cyclist and spent many more hours in the saddle, I've also become much more familiar with the potential pitfalls that can result as the miles add up. While flat tires and other minor mechanical ailments are trivial, crashes are potentially much more significant and, pun partially intended, impactful. A few years ago, just two days before leaving for the Ironman 70.3 World Championships, I had the misfortune of crashing my own bike and landed on my right shoulder, cracking my scapula and prematurely ending my season. I was devastated, as you might imagine, and plenty sore, but fortunately, with some time I healed and was eventually none the worse for wear. My injury was pretty unusual, though. For the, for the vast majority of cyclists who crash the way I did, landing on their shoulder, the shoulder blade is actually rarely broken. Instead, the most commonly broken bone in those circumstances is the collarbone or clavicle. Now, because this bone does not have a major role in any specific movement, and because its position prevents effective splinting, traditional management of fractures of this bone has been fairly conservative. Basically, just place the affected arm in a sling and let the bone heal over a few weeks. For the most part, this has worked out pretty well, but it hasn't been perfect, and as more and more people have become more and more active and more and more collarbone fractures are seen, alternative treatment strategies have been developed, raising today's listener question that I hope none of you will actually ever need to know the answer to, but if a friend or family member happens to need to know, you can share this segment with them. Essentially, the question is, should surgical management of clavicle fractures be considered superior to traditional conservative management and slinging? In order to answer this question, we first have to consider what advantages surgery might confer over conservative management, and on the other hand, what drawbacks might be involved. The two major problems with conservative management are the time that it takes for the bone to heal and the patient to be able to then return to activity, and the rate of non-union, when the bone fragments basically fail to join and the fracture essentially doesn't heal. For surgical management to be considered superior to conservative management, it would have to be better in both of these regards while offering no major drawbacks or complications. So what does the science say? Over the past decade and a half, several studies have been done to answer this question, and there are unfortunately few definitive answers one way or the other. There are several instances, though, when surgical management is clearly the superior option, and these cases were actually the traditional indications for surgery, before surgery was considered more standard. Surgical fixation of clavicle fractures is definitively indicated in any cases where the bone is angulated to enough of a degree where there is tenting of the skin overlying it, and thus a danger of damage to that skin. Any time the fracture involves the medial third of the clavicle, essentially any broke of the bone in the third closest to the center of the chest, any fracture where the bone fragments are significantly overlapping or far apart, and any fracture where the bone has been broken, in, broken into many pieces. Now, even with this seemingly long list of indications for surgery, this only comprises a small number of collarbone fractures. That's because the majority of fractures occur in the middle third of the bone and have fragments that are only slightly overlapping or apart. And it's these cases in which the choice to operate is not quite as straightforward. In the studies that have been done on those types of fractures, there is definitely some benefit of surgery over conservative management with respect to the two issues that are problematic for conservative management, that being the time to return to activity and the rate of non-union. With surgery, patients are actually able to return to activity slightly sooner than with conservative management, on the order of a week or so quicker. However, because surgical patients do not need to be in a sling nearly as long as non-surgical patients, surgical patients tend to be happier with their management and have more functionality with the affected shoulder sooner. Non-union rates are also significantly better in patients who have had surgery. Though in the past, non-union rates for conservative management was reported as a very infrequent occurrence, more recent studies have suggested that up to a quarter of these patients may have delayed or non-union, whereas patients who undergo surgery have rates of delayed or non-union in the order of 1% or less. But surgery does have some important downsides, and these need to be carefully considered, especially given the fact that conservative management is a perfectly acceptable approach for the vast majority of patients. As with any surgery, Open reduction and internal fixation of clavicle fractures carries with it all of the risks that come with any operation, 
These include the risks of anesthesia, infection of the wound, or other postoperative infections like pneumonia or wound infections, and frequently the need for a second surgery a year or so later to remove the hardware. Now, the second operation is not a given, and more and more it doesn't actually seem to be necessary. But for many patients, especially women and those who get this uh, fracture and surgery when they're older, the hardware becomes problematic after time, causing irritation or pain, and therefore needs to be removed. The second operation then exposes the patient to all of the same risks as the first one. So you can see how surgery is not necessarily the right answer in all cases. Now, with that said... I know several people who have had this injury, and almost all of them have had their fractures repaired surgically. Interestingly, three of the guests on this podcast over the first 19 episodes who are friends of mine had their broken clavicle surgically repaired and all did very well, and none needed a second operation to remove their hardware. Still, they worked closely with their surgeons to review all of the options and to understand all of the risks before deciding whether or not to have the procedure. Once the decision is made to have the procedure, how the surgical fixation is carried out is another matter of debate. There are several ways that the bone can be fixed, but most surgeons today have moved to either single or dual plating of fractures, though in special cases, different approaches can be required. So what's the right answer? In this case, I'm not entirely sure that there is one. Certainly for the case that I listed earlier, surgery is the preferred management option to ensure a good functional outcome. But for the majority of uncomplicated middle third fractures, the answer really isn't that clear. I think if it were me, I would want the surgery. But if the surgeon was at all reluctant, believing that conservative management was just as good or potentially a better way to go without the risks of an operation, then I would likely defer to his or her judgment. I just don't see a compelling enough argument to argue for surgical repair in all cases at this time. Do you have a question for me to consider answering on this podcast? Well, please email it to me at tri underscore doc at icloud.com. My guest on the podcast today is former professional triathlete Cameron Dye. Cameron was born and raised in Boulder, Colorado, and has always had a passion for competition and setting big goals. He began swimming competitively at the age of eight and continued all the way through his four years at the University of Iowa, where he was the team captain his senior year. After receiving a degree in finance, he moved back to Boulder to pursue his next athletic dream of becoming a professional triathlete. After a 12-year career that included 36 career victories, three lifetime fitness Toyota Cup Series titles between 2012 and 14, and a bronze medal at the ITU World Championship Relays in 2013, he formally retired in 2018. After retiring, he returned to his financial education and began a job as a wealth manager at White Hawk Wealth Management in Boulder, where he currently lives with his wife, Natalie, and two children. But today, he joins me on the podcast. Welcome, Cam. Hey, how are you doing, Jeff? Great. It's uh, really nice to have you here and great to meet you here in your house in Boulder. Appreciate you coming by. It's nice to meet you. So tell me, you came from a swimming background. What was your introduction to triathlon? So yeah, I started swimming when I was eight. Um kind of a funny story the reason I got started was because I had cousins that were swimmers and when I visited them in uh, Missouri they had these big uh, cork boards full of medals and ribbons and my eight-year-old brain decided well that was pretty cool so I'll uh, I'll start swimming and see if I can earn some medals or ribbons um, neither of my parents swam so it was kind of a yeah I was I was the individual swimmer in the family um, got into swimming and then uh, swam all the way through college but in high school I had a, a swim coach uh, Grant Hollicky who was sort of an ex-terra professional triathlete um, here in Boulder and was training with him and we got to talking and decided to do the Boulder Peak when I was 15 here. Um, Won my age group uh, and it was ironically the only time I've ever qualified for Kona technically because Boulder Peak was a a Kona qualifier if you could believe it back then. (laughs) Um, But being 15 I couldn't have gone anyway and had no interest and uh, but yeah so that was you know started there and then I was running cross country in high school swimming in high school um, I'd been introduced to Tim DeBoom and Matt Reed and Simon Lessing and, you know, a lot of the who's who of triathletes that happened to live here. And um, through that, just sort of developed a passion for the sport. And it was in the Olympics in 2000 for the first time. And so that was a that was sort of a big driver. I'd realized my uh, my Olympic dreams and swimming were probably not ever going to come to fruition. I just wasn't that fast. And uh, but the whole idea of a triathlon sort of gave me a renewed sense of that that Olympic dream. And um, yeah, I mean, it started out well when I was 15, knew I needed to go to college, wanted to go to college, swim in college, get a degree, and then I knew I wanted to give it a shot when I graduated. So I moved back to Boulder, and that's the story. And did you know pretty early on that 
a pro career was realistic for you, uh, even in college? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know that anybody really knows whether being a professional triathlete is a realistic career. Um, it's, uh, I, I had a lot of confidence myself. Um, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by extremely supportive parents. Um, you know, they never balked at it at all when I said I was going to graduate and then become a professional triathlete. They were, they were my first sponsors. Um, and I had, like I say, Grant was a coach. I had a high school coach, Bob Smart, here in town that actually helped me get a bike for that race when I was 15. And, um, you know, I sat and talked to Matty Reed and some of these other guys and it seemed like worth giving a shot. Um, I mean, I knew I would put in the work and then we'd see what happened, but I was willing to at least give it a try. I mean, I think for a lot of guys graduating from college, if you want to be a professional triathlete, I think it's easier to go straight into it when you don't have anything to lose really i mean you can always go get a job later i think the struggle is when people go get a job first then decide they don't like their job want to go pro later i mean i almost think it was easier to do it the way i did it just straight away um and like i say i had a lot of support and i was lucky enough to be disciplined enough to put in the work and then also get the results just in time um i mean the year before i won my first race was probably like the hardest year of my athletic career because <laughs> no, no joke, I was one out of the money at every race I went to. Wow. It didn't matter if it paid three deep, five deep, seven deep, 10 deep. It was like a jinx. It was like, I just could not make money. Mm. Um, and so I had been working as a swim coach. I'd been working, making sandwiches at Panera, doing odd jobs on the weekends, you know, just footing the bills. Cause the one deal I'd made with myself when I graduated was I would never move back home. I was going to do this on my own with my parents, you know, like support and, um, but I wasn't going to move back home. I wasn't going to do that. Right. So I was able to pull that off just long enough. And after that season of, of not making any money, I had sort of a come to Jesus with my coaches and we were like, okay, we'll give it one more year. We're going to dial back everything else. You know, I quit the job at Panera, cut my coaching way back and basically went all in on triathlon. And then, um, was able to to win a race that next year and make some money and actually start to think, okay, maybe this is real. That was 2009, and then in 2010, came out in the spring and won St. Anthony's, and that was sort of the, the tipping point for the whole thing. All of a sudden, it became real. I mean, it was me and Greg Bennett and Craig Alexander standing on the podium at what used to be one of the biggest races in the world. So it was, yeah. That's kind of interesting. I, I, I mean, in my own career as an age grouper, uh, I used to say that winning was not something that was possible for me, and yet when I finally got success, once it seems like once you get success, it begets further success. It's almost like you need that confidence to believe that you can continue to, to see that kind of success in the future. And it's interesting to hear that as a professional, there's almost the same kind of tipping point. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think you know, I'm, a, I'm an extremely positive person. I have as much confidence in my own abilities as anybody, but... It really is until you actually put it together. There's always that little bit of doubt in the back of your mind. Well, can I actually win a big race? And you know, I mean, I don't, you can do all the visualizing you want and all that stuff, but yeah, until you actually do it, I think it. And I think that's honestly a place where a lot of triathletes, and I'm sure athletes in every sport, they just sort of get stuck. You know, like you get to a podium, or you get third, or you you know, you're fourth, and you're right there, and you're kind of close. But I think in in the back of their own minds, it it becomes a mental battle. Well, yeah, but can I win? Like, right. Can I actually get there? And until you do, it's, it's a tough, yeah. tough grind. Mm. Um, so in a 12 year career, what were some of the highlights that you look back on and really think of as distinguishing uh, or as things that you look back on fondly, maybe not necessarily victories, but things that really stand out? Sure. Um, I mean, that, that first win at St. Anthony's will always probably be my favorite win because, like we were talking about, it just it solidified, okay, I can really do this. Um, and to beat you know some of the biggest names in the sport who I'd looked up to for years, was that was a really cool, cool moment. Um, you know, I, winning the Lifetime Series uh, in 2012 will always be super special. Um, I, <laughs> it was six races, I believe, that year, and the last two races in the series were the Los Angeles Triathlon, and then Dallas was the finale. And I went to LA, won in LA, flew home, that was a Sunday, flew home Sunday night. By you know two in the morning, I was in the hospital with my wife, she was pregnant. 
she was three weeks not due yet. <laughs> we were still three weeks out, but she was having some some discomfort, so we went in and ended up being induced. So my son was born, you know, like 28 hours later or so. Um, our first child, uh, we'd only been married about a year. It was just a super big whirlwind of winning a big race, having a baby, and then on top of that, knowing I had to leave two days later to go finish the series because I was in the lead for the series and it was a $60,000 series. I mean, it was going to make my year if I could go win the series for sure and really set us up well as a family. Um, so, I mean, the really sad part was I didn't get to leave the hospital with them, you know, two days later cause they were still in the hospital, but, um, flew down to Dallas, ended up getting second in the race, but that was enough to win the series and got to fly home then and have a brand new baby and a big paycheck and just a crazy 10 days. Um, so that'll always be probably one of my favorite moments in the sport. And then, um, in 2013, winning that bronze medal at ITU worlds when they did the relay, um, I believe it was the first time it was actually a world championship medal event. Um, I could be wrong. It may have been before, but it was the first time the U S had actually like, we'd taken it seriously. I mean, I'd spoken with USAT for, six weeks, eight weeks before, like, Hey, do you want to do this? Um, my strengths sort of play to that, you know, fast swim, really hard bike. And it's a short enough run that I can sort of fake it. Um, so to go over there and, uh, yeah, get, get third with Gwen and Sarah Groff and Ben Canute when he was just a baby. Um, it's the first time I met Ben was sharing a room with him at that race. And now he's, you know, top three at world 70.3. And, um, it's been fun to watch his career, but yeah, I mean, those, I always think those three races are probably the the three coolest moments. Hmm. What's a you know what's the day to day life of a pro triathlete? I, I think a lot of us as age groupers we look at pros and we think, gosh, that'd be an awesome job. But I mean, at some point, it's got to be just that. It's got to be a job. And I, I'm just curious, you know, it, it must become a grind at times. It must be like you know, there's got to be days when you get up and just be like, God, not again. No, for sure. Um, I mean, there's plenty of days where you wake up and the last thing you want to do is be at the pool by 7 30 for swim practice or you know saturday morning especially once i had kids i'm sitting on the couch with my kids and i look at my watch and shoot i gotta get out for a five-hour ride and i'm not gonna see them for another five six hours um and i think it's really important you'll find that all of the professionals that make a living so they're i mean they have a professional car but truly make a living at it very much treat it like a job and I think that is one of the differences between the pros that end up making a career out of it and the people that sort of wash out after a couple of years is some of them have the ability. They just never quite are able to dial it in as a job. They can't treat it like a job um, because I think at the end of the day, it is. I mean, it's a fantastic job. It's one of the coolest jobs in the world. And I got to see the world and travel and represent the U.S. and do all kinds of awesome things. But at times, it's definitely a job. And I think that's the day to day. I mean, it's seven days a week, I think is honestly the hardest part of it. Um, and age groupers do that too. I mean, honestly, I've always been as or more impressed with the age groupers like yourself that, you know, you have a full-time job and a family and you're training for an Ironman. Um, I mean, I had the luxury of training was my job, so I could prioritize that, but you can still only train so many hours in a week. So it still leaves some free time during the day to see the kids and, you know, here and there. But yeah, I mean, I think the hardest part for me was always just the fact that it was seven days a week, um, especially once you had kids. Like, I'd be gone part of both weekend days, so we didn't get to do the trips some of the other families did. And, um, I mean, my wife's a saint. She always called it Single Mom Saturday because I'd, you know, wake up, go swim for 90 minutes, grab breakfast, go ride for four or five hours, then maybe run and finally be done at four in the afternoon or something. So for her, it was another almost like a full work day for her. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's... Look, I had zero regrets. I loved every second of it, but there are definitely days where you wake up and it's a grind like any other. And I imagine, you know, in thinking about the transition to going to life after triathlon, that's probably why you don't see so many pros continuing as age groupers afterwards, it, it, because it is a job. It's not, uh, it's, it, it's different motivation than what, what we as age groupers do it for. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I... Never say never, but I don't think you will ever see me race another triathlon unless it's to do it with my kids someday or, you know, if they want to do their first race, maybe I'll sign up and do it with them. Um, But, yeah, having done it as a job for so long, I think it's, one, it's hard to look at it as anything but a job. 
two, it's, you know, I know how fast I once was right. and I'm, I'm never going to be that fast again. Um, and I think it's, yeah, I know what it takes to be even reasonably fast and the time commitment it takes. And I mean, it beats your body up and after doing it for 12 years. And I think also having just stacked it straight on top of a college swimming career and, you know, the rest of my athletics, this is basically the first time in my life at 34 last year when I retired where all of a sudden sports wasn't the focus of my daily life. I mean, obviously school was important, but still when you're swimming in college, it's two practices a day and that's, that's a big way on you. And, uh, yeah, I mean, because of that, I don't know that I'll ever do another one. So to follow on that, how hard is it to transition to life after sport? You go from the discipline of training and practice and everything else. And now you really got to shift your mental focus to completely different i mean obviously you can translate some of it uh and you clearly had the training to move into a financial career but for many triathletes i wonder how how difficult is it to you know move into life after sport yeah i for better or worse i never had a problem taking a break you know like my favorite three weeks of the year were the three weeks where i didn't train after that last race and that that goes back to the first year i raced too because it was just that chance where you could be totally undisciplined you could go out late you could have a few extra beers you could you know wake up and do whatever you wanted to do um and that was always really important for me was being able to not only be super disciplined during the season but then take a break when it was time to take a break so I think for me I was lucky in that when I retired it was time to retire I was a hundred percent ready to be done I had no doubts that I was ready to be done and lucky enough after a few months I realized that I didn't you know because there's always that slight fear that you're going to wake up one morning and miss it think you screwed up did something early um, and that's never happened I mean I've gone to races gone to watch races traveled out to Alcatraz to watch this year and that was one of my favorite races and I truly enjoyed just watching so I think for me it was a relief to know that I truly was ready to hang it up Um, but then I think, you know, you're still able to use the discipline I used every day to get up and go train. I'd get up every day and now and wake up at six and open up the computer and look at what the markets did overnight. And, you know, then I can hang out with the kids, I'll eat breakfast and then put them on the bus to go to school and then go to work. And, um, I mean, it's, I think for me having at least some sort of a routine was really important. I mean, I'm definitely a creature of habit. You could... (laughs) Some of the guys I trained with for years and years, it was like, if you knew what time it was and what day of the week it was, you could probably figure out where I was. Um, And I think that's partly what made me so successful was my consistency. But I think those same things apply to any job. So yeah, I was lucky enough to, you know, have a second career that I was excited about, something I really wanted to do. Um, I mean, I've always been passionate about the stock market and um, I think now being able to help other people is kind of a rewarding experience too with athletics being such a selfish thing. Mm -hmm. Um, just, it has to be, I mean, you have to look out for you all the time. So to now be able to sit down with somebody and truly help them with their financial situation and make good decisions and be in a better place is Mm -hmm. that's pretty rewarding. But I think just the discipline that applies to athletics and the consistency of it, if you have something to do, you can apply all that stuff. And, um, yeah, that's sort of, I think the key to transitioning is having that, you know, figuring out what you want to do next and then kind of being disciplined about it, you know, Mm -hmm. having that consistency. Because I think the one problem you see with athletes, not necessarily triathletes, I think, because most most triathletes anyway, you know, have a college degree and they have some sort of backup plan. Um, But definitely like the, the ball sports, the big four sports, like you see people retire and, you know, think about how does a guy blow through a hundred million dollars? Yeah because they didn't know what else to do. Yeah. And so I think having that that discipline and that, you know, desire to do something else is important and then sticking to it. Yeah. But, do do most pro triathletes just step away from the sport completely like you did or or do you think that some st- I, I know you're coaching, but do do most just like just walk away or do some, do most sort of keep some kind of uh, involvement? I mean, I'd say it's probably 50-50. I think yeah, I mean for me I really wanted to keep coaching. Um, I've found I've been coaching swimming since I was 15 and I found that I really enjoyed that part of triathlon with helping other people kind of achieve their goals and aspirations in the sport because it gave me so much and I feel like I've you know learned a lot over all these years and I can pass that on Um, so I think coaching is a huge opportunity for pros that want to stay involved to some degree I mean you see a lot of pros do that 
you also, you see a lot of pros go to work for former sponsors or other industry companies or even the race organizations, you know, Ironman, ITU, go work for those, those bodies as a way to stay in the sport, but not physically competing anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, I think you do find a handful of people that just sort of step away because when they're done, they're done and they loved it, but it's time to move on. And I think that's one of the beauties of, of sport. I mean, I guess everybody when you start you know there's an end date you don't know exactly when it's going to be but nobody plays sports forever mm-hmm. um i mean triathlon is unique in that if you wanted to go down the age group rabbit hole you could keep doing it forever and ever um but it's yeah there's a there's a shelf life on a pro athlete and yeah i think that's it's both a good and a bad thing yeah um are you familiar with the new york times article that came out uh, this past weekend on the declining numbers in triathlon I, it's funny. Somebody mentioned it to me the other day. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but um, I, I guess I'm not surprised. Well, I guess you know. I mean, there, there, there's been comments, and I've read some discussions on discussion boards, uh, even from current pros, talking about how there's not as many young pros coming in. Uh, I guess that's not something I had really paid attention to. Um, do you sense the sport is under threat? And oh, I think the sport's in trouble. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I was actually, I've had this conversation with my wife for three or four years now where, you know, I came up at a time when I ended up making my career in short course, but everybody used to start in short course because that was how you kind of transitioned from whatever you did before, swimming, running, cycling. You'd start with the Olympic distance stuff and you kind of get your feet wet and then, okay, well, if that's not your thing, you go longer. And over the last, you know, I mean, I won that last Lifetime Series in 2014. That was the last time there was a professional Lifetime Series. So for the last five years, the biggest, some of the biggest races in the world have no longer existed for professionals. And then the Escape Series came along. And then this year, fortuitously for me, since I retired, most of the races I did last year don't exist this year for pros. Um, I mean, even New York City Triathlon, which has had a pro race for a very long time, they canceled the pro race at the beginning of this year, so they didn't have one this year. Um, And I think there's a lot of different factors that go into it. Um, I mean, like that same New York City race this year, they ended up canceling the whole race for the 4,000 people that had flown to New York two days before the race because the city pulled the permits because of the heat in the forecast. And, you know, I flew to Washington, D.C. last year for the Nations Try in September, I believe it was, and they got a bunch of rain and part of the bike course was underwater and the swim was going to be super rough. And so they canceled that race. And it's weird because I'd gone my whole career without ever having a race canceled. I mean, you've had swims canceled far too often, but not the whole race. Mm -hmm. So I think that was sort of an interesting tipping point for that was you were starting to see races get canceled which, I mean, if you've planned months of training and stuff around this one race and you're an age grouper and you, you know, you skipped weekends with your family to train for this and then you get there and all well, the race doesn't happen, it's completely out of your control. But that that's tough. And I think one of the struggles with triathlon in general is the logistics of it. I mean, the courses are sometimes hard to manage. They take a lot of volunteers and cones and police officers and permits and um, knowing a couple race directors now, I have a better understanding for, you know, what goes into that part of it. Um, and I think too, you've got a, uh, you've got the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is Ironman and they don't care about short course at all. Um, you saw it when they bought the Boulder peak and the Columbia try years ago when they were doing the 5150 series and they sort of, they had this thing going for a couple years because they were trying to take advantage of the hype behind high V as soon as high V disappeared, so did those races. I mean, the Boulder Peak was wiped off the map after 25 years. Columbia Trial was around for 30 years, and then all of a sudden it disappeared after life to, or after uh, Iron Man took it over. Um, and I think Iron Man is sort of, to their own detriment, they're cannibalizing the sport in some ways by getting rid of these short course races or not pr- not helping promote short course racing because that's the gateway to Iron Man, right? I mean, very few people are going to come off the couch and do an Iron Man. More will do a 70.3, but the same thing. Like if you're not training for it or you train for that one for a couple months, it's going to be a pretty miserable experience. Like there's no way to make that fun. And if it's miserable, you're not ever going to sign up again. And I think that's why you're seeing Iron Man in a lot of ways leave North America, start to go to other parts of the world where there's growing middle class. There's been a lot less races offered. 
and they're trying to take their, you know, their model elsewhere. And at the end of the day, if it's whether it's owned by a hedge fund like it was or a VC fund, and now it's owned by a Chinese billionaire's company, I mean, it's it's a for profit business. And for them, the bottom line is the most important thing, which unfortunately is the opposite of like a local race where the experience for the athletes is the most important thing. And so I think you got a lot of things going against the sport right now. Um, and on top of all that, you've sort of seen a resurgence in 5Ks and Spartan races and these other opportunities to go compete athletically that are a lot less involved. You don't need a big expensive bike. You don't need a wetsuit. You don't necessarily have to travel as far. You need a pair of shoes and shorts and you need to go for a few runs before you go do it. Um, and I think generation, generationally, you're seeing an older generation of triathletes sort of transition out of the sport because they've gotten older and their kids have grown up and they've had enough with it. And you're not seeing an influx of younger people from professionals or just, you know, millennial aged people. Um, it's a big barrier of entry with all the, the stuff you need. It's expensive. I mean, you know, Ironman charges $250, $300 for a half and $800 for a full or whatever it is. And that's a, that's a lot of money. Um, when you can spend 35 bucks and go to a 5k, still get a medal, still get a t-shirt, still get a beer Hmm. and you're done after 40 minutes. Um, so unfortunately I think there's, it's going to be an interesting next five or 10 years for the sport of triathlon. I think, because unless you see local races pick up steam and are able to sort of attract people back to the sport. And I think, in a in a big way, that's going to be sort of an Ironman issue they're going to need to get involved with that in some way because still to this day when i tell people i was a triathlete the first question is always oh did you do iron man or oh did you do kona because even after all these years of racing and all the races i won and all the money i made it's still that is triathlon in most people's mind so they could use that for some really good things to promote the sport but if they don't go after that grassroots level athlete and that beginner i don't know where they're going to get people to sign up for the Ironman. I mean, and even their numbers have dwindled in the States a lot at some of these races. I mean, Boulder Ironman happened for the last time. They didn't renew it. Who knows whether it was the city or whether it was the fact that they were never selling it out anymore. But, um, yeah, I don't know that it's the rosiest of pictures right now for the sport. Yeah. No, you raise a lot of excellent points, and I think uh, you're right. I think uh, think the writing is on the wall, and I think that uh, the WTC and USAT together are going to have to... uh, probably work together to sort it out and get uh, where they need to go. Uh, Cameron Dye had a 12-year professional career that included 36 career victories. He is currently retired, happily, I might add, and is uh, now working as a wealth manager at Whitehawk Wealth Management here in Boulder. And uh, thank you so much for joining me on the TriDark Podcast today. Uh, My pleasure, Jeff. Thanks for having me. And now it's time for the Triathlete Routard. That segment of the program when I discuss and provide a kind of travel guide to one of the popular races on the WTC calendar. On this episode, I'm going to be talking about the popular and long-standing race right here in Colorado, the Boulder 70.3. This race had its beginning as part of the 5430 series and has been around for longer than most half Ironman distance races in the country. I personally have participated in 10 of these events, and for that reason, I'm going to handle this segment on my own for this time around. The Boulder 70.3 race is a simply beautiful race, and over the years has become renowned for its fast bike course, spectacular scenery, welcoming environment, but hot and challenging run. Is it one that you should consider doing? I definitely think so, and let me tell you why. In terms of signing up and whether or not you should do so quickly, this race does tend to sell out but it's not one that you need to sign up for immediately as soon as registration opens. Over the past couple of years, the Boulder 70.3 tends to sell out around two or three months before the race actually takes place, so you do have a little bit of time to make a decision. However, I wouldn't put it off too long. In the past couple of years, the race has sold out as early as six months before the race day and as late as just a few weeks before, but the race does tend to sell out pretty predictably, so I wouldn't leave it too long. I'd make your decision, and once you have made that decision, definitely go ahead and get signed up, because especially now with the tier pricing, you probably don't want to wait too long if you've already decided to do the race and end up having to pay more than you have to. 
In terms of traveling and gear transport considerations, there are uh, the usual suspects in terms of getting your gear here if you're coming from out of town. And if you're traveling here, there's a lot of concern about the altitude. Uh, That has been a factor in keeping people from doing this race. They think they're not going to have a fast time if they come here because they're going to be at a disadvantage against uh, people who live here and have acclimated to the altitude. I would say that this is probably a little bit overblown. What I tell people who are coming here from lower altitudes is that the altitude has most of its impact on people coming here for the first time on the swim. That may come as a bit of a surprise for people. Uh, When you get in the water and you start swimming at about a mile above sea level, the first thing you notice is how quickly you become out of breath when you're putting in a race-type effort. If you can get here a little early and get a few swims under your belt, you quickly become accustomed to that fact and you kind of modify your stroke rate so that you're able to swim a little more comfortably. People who get here uh, and really just make the race their first swim, I think they're the folks that end up having the most difficulty and are surprised at how short of breath they are. But all in all, if you get here a few days before, if you can get in the water, do a couple of swims and kind of like find your balance in terms of how you need to modify your sw- your stroke rate, how you need to modify your breathing, I think that most people will find that the altitude really doesn't have that much of an impact. And there are some pretty significant benefits. For example, on the bike, because the air is thinner here and the resistance is lower, you're significantly more aero. And so people actually move faster on the bike than they would at lower altitudes. And that's something that they may not appreciate until they get here. On the run, it's true that your heart rate may be a little bit higher for the perceived effort that you're putting in than you would be at lower altitudes, but I haven't encountered too many people who have said that they couldn't put in the kinds of run that they expected because they were here for just a week. That being said, there are a few things you need to take into consideration if you're coming here for the race. First and foremost is the sun and the lack of humidity. We are at higher altitude and therefore are exposed to much higher degrees of solar radiation and so it becomes much more easy to get sunburns and so you really have to pay attention to that and keep yourself covered and get a lot of sunscreen on. This is of particular importance at the Boulder Reservoir where there really isn't a lot of shade before and after the race and so you really want to make sure that you bring something to put on after the race when you're done so that you can get yourself covered up and also during the race take advantage of all the sunscreen being offered so that you can keep yourself from getting burned. The other thing is the lack of humidity. When I first moved here from lower altitudes and from an environment that was much more humid, I actually gauged my need to take in fluids by how much I sweated. And what it didn't appreciate right away is the fact that your sweat evaporates so quickly here that your clothes doesn't get as wet as it does when you're sweating at lower altitudes in a more humid environment. And so you have to take in fluids much more quickly here than you would if you're living in, say, Chicago, where you can really count on the amount of perspiration to sort of stick to you for longer. Now, that makes you more comfortable here, but it also makes you not really appreciate how much you're sweating. So you have to increase the amount of fluid you're taking in and you got to increase your sun protection. So yes, get here a few days early, try and expose yourself to what it feels like to run and to swim in this environment, and get used to the fact that you're going to have to take in more fluids. But on the flip side, be excited about the fact that your bike will actually be faster than you might otherwise expect. In terms of where to stay, most people stay within Boulder. There are tons of options, uh, lots of hotels, lots of inns, lots of B&Bs. Uh, one thing you need to be aware of is that getting to the reservoir on Saturday morning of the race, this is a Saturday race after all, uh, can be uh, an extraordinary affair. Um, the one road that gives access into the reservoir is notoriously uh, backed up. Uh, although they open the reservoir early, it uh, every year just to astonishes me how uh, much difficulty there is getting everyone into the reservoir. Now, in the last couple of years, they seem to have gotten that uh, done a little bit more quickly, and so people are in and actually get to transition on time. Uh, They've also added shuttles now that go from town, and so that is an option that you may want to explore. Uh, If you're staying at a hotel in Boulder, instead of bringing your car to the reservoir, get your car to one of the places where you can grab a shuttle and uh, get yourself to the reservoir that way. Uh, That certainly decreases the amount of cars coming in and increases the uh, efficiency of getting people to the reservoir. Another uh, trick 
is, and something that I do myself, even though I'm coming from the south, is I will drive all the way around the reservoir and get myself access from the north. Now, many of the access roads are actually blocked off because of um, the inability to cross Highway 119. If you're a local, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not, it's kind of hard for me to describe. Just trust me when I say it's very difficult to move from the east side of the reservoir to the west to get access coming from the north. But if you take Highway 36, you can go up to... Um, uh, Neva, turn right on Neva and then take one of the dirt roads down from the north into the reservoir. It's a little bit of a trek, but rather than sitting in traffic coming up 51st, you can actually get to the reservoir more quickly. Uh, let's talk about the course. The swim, it's very straightforward. It's a beautiful uh, morning swim. The sun is uh, rising by the time you start the swim. You make a uh, clockwise course uh, within the Boulder Reservoir, which as a reservoir, as a reservoir that is collecting water from uh, surrounding farmlands, has had episodes where uh, coliform counts can be high. But because we live in a fairly dry environment, rainfall around the time of the race tends to be low and therefore um, the reservoir does tend to be fairly clean at the time of the race, but something to be aware of. Uh, the water is, you know, it's not a lake, it's not crystal clear, but uh, it's certainly not any body of water that I would be worried about swimming in. I've done it many times and I've never had a problem. Uh, it is uh, beautifully scenic, uh, nestled as it is up against the Front Range Mountains. And when the sun is rising and you're ready to start your race, it really it makes for a spectacular setting. Getting into the water, the course is clockwise. The buoys are to your right uh, for the entire time. Uh, you make a, a swim of around six or 700 meters before taking a hard right, swimming for another 150 or so, and then another hard right, and then swimming all the way to shore for the duration of the swim. Uh, if uh, you're looking to your right in order to track the buoys, the sun will be in your eyes uh, as you turn. And then once you make that first right-hand turn, the sun is directly ahead of you. And so there is some difficulty sighting on the short leg of the swim. But then once you make the second right-hand turn, it's very easy to see for the rest of the swim. It is a uh, self-seated rolling start. And uh, this year they actually had us in shoots of five. So five people were starting at a time. And I have to say, I thought this this worked exceptionally well. Uh, people seated themselves pretty well. I didn't run into any traffic myself and found myself getting out of the water pretty much when I expected to. The water was very warm this year. They uh, somehow managed to find a spot where they could measure the water to be wetsuit legal, but uh, I find it hard to believe that uh, the water was not higher than 76 degrees. Nonetheless, I took advantage of being able to use my wetsuit, didn't find it too terrible, and uh, got through the swim just fine. The uh, transition, uh, T1 serves as T2 as well. Uh, coming out of the swim is fairly easy. You go up a boat ramp. You have to run uh, maybe 100, 150 meters to get yourself into T1. There are wetsuit strippers there. And then once into T1, uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable on your feet. I usually, and I do for this race, keep my shoes in my pedals. I have to say, though, the surface of the parking lot that you're running in is quite uncomfortable. There are a lot of pebbles on the ground, and I almost wonder if it isn't worth just putting your shoes on and running with your shoes on because you might actually go faster. I find myself hopping and, and just running with like really tenderly to get, uh, for, uh, uh, get my bike to the mount line. So that's something to consider. Uh, once you get out of transition, it's fairly straightforward. It's basically you run in a swim one at one end and out with your bike the other. Once you're on the bike, uh, the bike course changes almost every year. So whatever I tell you now about the bike course might be different for next year. Um, however, the bike course has been the same the last two years, so it might stay the same. We'll see. Basically, the bike course is really pretty fast. Uh, there is a, a reasonable amount of climbing for a 70.3, but it all takes place in the first half of the bike course. Now, I know a lot of people probably think, well, it's Boulder, you're going to be climbing up in the mountains. You actually never do. You uh, never get into the front range. All of the riding takes place along the front range and never goes into it. That being said, there is a couple of hills in the first half of the bike course. Uh, but before you get there, you do a very, very fast loop on Highway 119, otherwise known as the Diagonal Highway. That section of the road is completely closed. So you are riding along the right side of that road. You uh, get to the turnaround and come back on the other side of the road. And it's very nice. It's very, very fast. And best of all, no cars. 
Uh, once you get off of that, you uh, get onto the rural roads of uh, Boulder. You climb up Neva to Highway 36, where you're then for the uh, first of two times on Highway 36. Now, Boulder has had the Ironman and has several triathlons that run along Highway 36. And Highway 36 is one of those roads that is kind of, it's a love-hate sort of thing. Um, triathletes are constantly training on this road. It does have a pretty good shoulder, but there are numerous incidents between cars and cyclists that occur every year because motorists don't pay attention um, and inevitably there are interactions. Uh, unfortunately, a few years ago during the Boulder Ironman, uh, a cyclist uh, left the shoulder to try and pass a, a cycli- another cyclist and was struck from behind by a motorist and killed. This has never happened in the 70.3, but it remains a, uh, a risk. Uh, the shoulder is coned off, and I cannot say more strongly as a cyclist, I don't care what you're doing, I don't care how badly you want to pass somebody, do not, under any circumstances, get out of those cones because the motorists are still coming along that highway at high speed and uh, they I mean there hasn't been any issues with motorists crossing through the cones but if a cyclist goes through the cones into the road they are putting themselves in significant jeopardy so do make sure you stay within the cones and everything should be fine. Uh, You travel along uh, 36 for a little while and then you make a right hand turn onto Nelson and have a lightning fast descent You then make a left turn and then come up uh, St. Vrain, which is a uh, very challenging climb, especially the last part, which gets up to about 8%, I believe. Uh, And then once you're back up to the top of uh, St. Vrain, which gets you back onto Highway 36, you're pretty much done with the climbing. The rest of the route is either downhill or slightly rolling. You get onto the Ute Highway, which has a very wide shoulder. Uh, you uh, then get yourself up onto 75th and then make your way back to the Boulder Reservoir. The tricky part of the course is that you have to do another loop of the Highway 119. In the past, this has been a source of confusion for cyclists and led to some disqualifications, but this year I didn't see any. And so I think they have uh, done a great job of communicating this uh, part of the course and also did a very good job with signage. So basically, before entering the reservoir, you pass the reservoir, do another loop of Highway 119, and then come back to the reservoir and go in. Uh, The course, as I said, is extremely fast. The road surfaces are great. There's really no uh, major danger points except for the time that you're on Highway 36. And again, if you stay on the shoulder and stay out of trouble, cyclists stay to the right so that you can be passed safely. You just won't have any issues. Now we get to the run course. The run course is notoriously challenging. In the past, it's been two loops of the reservoir itself on a dirt road that involve two pretty, you know, reasonable climbs. Although the course itself doesn't have a significant amount of elevation, the second lap of the run course was always just brutal. And the reason for that is because Boulder at this time of year, especially in about midday in August, can be unbelievably hot. And this year, once again, was no different. Uh, The high temperature of the day was about 96 degrees, and even in dry heat, and with no shade whatsoever on a dirt road where the heat is just being reflected back up on you and the road itself is, is super hot, it just really wears you down. The surface to run on is slow uh, because, uh, you know, it's a loose, gravelly sort of road. And so every step you take, your foot slides just a little bit. And so run times tend to be a little bit slower than uh, you would otherwise hope for, given the heat and also the fact that the run surface is slow. Now, this year, they made a change to the course. Rather than running around the reservoir twice, we actually did an out and back that we did twice uh, that took us on the same roads. But uh, just uh, instead of going around, we just did this out and back. And I have to say the run course itself should have been faster. But because of the uh, heat of the day, it ended up being pretty similar. In fact, maybe a little bit slower times than one would otherwise expect. Support along the course is phenomenal. Uh, the aid stations, uh, very well placed, very well stocked. Uh, there was plenty of ice, plenty of water, plenty of food. Everything really went tremendously well. And I would say that um, despite the difficulty of the run course given the day, uh, this uh, really is a fun run course to do. You're constantly with other runners going uh, out and back and seeing people. And uh, you can, you know, it, it's a rolling course. So even if you see people in your age group, you can't necessarily tell where you are in relation to them but 
uh, you definitely have a way to gauge uh, sort of where you are in the field and 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 able to uh, to tell uh, how you're doing. So uh, overall, uh, a tremendous uh, day, a tremendous race, and one that I wholeheartedly support and encourage people to consider doing. The community has uh, in the past been lukewarm in terms of the farmers uh, whose roads are impacted, but uh, in the past couple of years, I, uh, there are so many races in Boulder now, I almost get the sense that they've kind of capitulated and sort of you know embraced triathlon as much as they can. Uh, this year, I saw lots of people out on their driveways cheering us on as we went by and I really appreciated that and I always uh, acknowledge them so I was glad to see that uh, drafting not a big problem on the bike especially with uh, the bike course especially with the self-seated swim uh, rolling start I thought uh, you know that that's always a good thing to to see a fair and uh, well done uh, bike and really uh, this is a tremendous race it's a popular race for a reason it's lasted as long as it has for a reason they have not yet announced the date for next year I wonder with the absence of Ironman Boulder if they'll consider moving it back to June there are fairly high number of races that take place in the early season already so I, I wouldn't be surprised if they kept the race in August but you know just keep an eye open to see if they do decide to move it up right now it's a qualifier for the um the subsequent year's 70.3 world championship so if it stays in August it would be a qualifier for St. George so an early qualifier for St. George if that's something you're interested in Again, uh, the Boulder 70.3 race, an excellent race, uh, well-designed course, very well supported. And even though it's at altitude, if you're somebody who's uh, not living at altitude, I, I really would not let that discourage you. I would uh, definitely consider coming out this way. Uh, if you have any questions about this race or want to know uh, anything more about it, please uh, drop me a line. I'd be happy to discuss it and uh, give you more information. And that's it for another episode of the TriDoc Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Links to the medical references as well as to everything else discussed on the show can be found in the show notes at www.tridocpodcast.podbean.com. If you have feedback or a question for consideration to be answered on the program, please email me at tri underscore doc at icloud.com. If you're interested in coaching services, please visit www.tridoccoaching.com where you can find a lot of information about me and the services I provide. The music heard at the beginning and the end of the show is Radio by Empty Hours and is used with permission. This song and many others like it can be found at www.reverbnation.com where I hope that you'll visit and give small independent bands a chance. The TriDoc Podcast will be back again soon with another listener question for me to answer, an interview with former professional triathlete and current triathlon race director Lance Panjuti, and the triathlete Rutau will again remain close to my home with a review of the inaugural SBT gravel race held in Steamboat Springs. Until then, train hard, train healthy.